Good afternoon and welcome to the Angry Astronaut. Well, at long last, it's time to finally say goodbye to this little ship. And uh, I'm kind of sad to do it. Well, I'll be straightforward about it. I'm extremely sad to do this because I feel that the Dianetics Alpaca was just an amazing concept. Very straightforward, very viable, something that we could have built in the space of a few years and something that could have been very flexible in the exploration of the lunar surface as we prepared to more effectively colonize it, to go there to stay in the long run. But before you can go someplace to stay, you have to explore it and determine where the best locations to stay are going to be. This was the ideal ship for that. Completely reusable, very flexible, capable of setting down in a wide variety of lunar terrain, but most importantly, something that didn't require that we build an entirely new infrastructure using untested technology and untested rockets. Had we proceeded with Alpaca from the very beginning, from the first contract award, I believe that we would have been well on our way to landing on the moon with Artemis 3 in 2025, given that the original Alpaca design was intended to set down on the moon in 2024, and even though it had some design flaws which disqualified it during the initial selection process, these flaws were corrected almost immediately before even the announcement was made as to who was going to be selected. And since that time, it has changed very little, aside from becoming even more viable, more reusable, and requiring fewer launches and the development of less untested technology, and more importantly, untested and untried rockets. This is a solution that could have worked in the short run, something that could have gotten, gotten us to the moon quickly. However, given the decision that we have just seen NASA make, I believe that NASA has a different philosophy than they had back in the days of Apollo. We have a new race now. There is a new race to the moon going on. And this race is with the Chinese. And instead of playing this game to win, NASA is more focused on not losing. And although that sounds like one and the same thing, you're going to find out that it isn't. And this different philosophy that NASA is taking, although perhaps safer in the long run, is also going to probably lose us this race and cede Tackleton Crater to the People's Republic of China. Okay, before I trigger all of you a lot further, let me be clear about one thing. When I talk about rockets that have yet to be flown, Starship has obviously flown, but at the same time, it's not a mature system that's likely to be able to take anything to the moon anytime soon. It's going to be years before this rocket is capable of doing that, whereas Vulcan Centaur's first mission is to the moon. Its capability of delivering cargo to the moon should have happen this year unless something goes really wrong with it. And if you can't use Vulcan Centaur, you could use Ariane 6 or any other rocket with a 5 meter fairing to deliver the alpaca. Not so with this new Blue Moon Lander. This is all we know about it. And by the way, this is frustrating as well. We're not getting a whole lot of visual information about this lander. The competition is over, guys. Why do we need to keep 
this such a secret? So anyway, this is what we know about it thus far. First of all, the thing stands the height of a five-story office building. It's not as big as Starship, but it's still really, really big. It has a dry mass of 16 metric tons, and if you include its propellant of liquid hydrogen and liquid oxygen, that's 45 metric tons. So something this heavy is impossible to deliver to lunar orbit with anything that's currently in development. Even New Glenn is only capable of delivering 45 metric tons to low Earth orbit, not to lunar orbit. So obviously something this heavy will have to be refueled in low Earth orbit, very much like Starship. You couldn't even deliver it to lunar orbit dry using New Glenn because New Glenn is not really capable of delivering almost 20 tons to lunar orbit, at least not in its current configuration. Maybe if it adds a third stage, it'll be able to do that, or perhaps with the aid of the Lockheed Martin Lunar Transporter, or Cis Lunar Transporter, that is, which, by the way, we have yet to see. This is going to require not only a rocket that's a long ways from flying, but also a lunar transporter that we have yet to even see the design for, let alone any solid information as to when it might fly for the first time. So many new technologies or just new launch vehicles that are going to have to be built to deliver this lander. I frankly don't see that being feasible any time before the 2030s, whereas Alpaca only required SLS and Vulcan Centaur. And by the way, not a separate launch of SLS, but rather just the use of the SLS Exploration Upper Stage and Universal Service Adapter, something that has to exist before Artemis V can even take place. It's a lander that was simply a lot more viable and a lot more feasible in the short term. However, there are very good reasons that NASA selected this lander in spite of all the drawbacks I've just talked about. So let's turn to the NASA selection statement to find out exactly what NASA found to be so impressive about this lander. Quote, Blue Origin is proposing what I consider to be a unique and highly advantageous aspect of its technical approach that matures several technologies critical to the success of the crewed and cargo landers early in the development cycle to burn down risk associated with the current low technology readiness levels of multiple technologies. Specifically, Blue Origin plans to fund and execute Pathfinder lander missions in 2024 and 2025 to land on the moon to mature several critical low technological readiness level technologies three years before the sustaining lunar development uncrewed demonstration mission. So what does this mean? Well, well, my interpretation is that New Glenn will be delivering a Pathfinder version of the Blue Moon Lander to the moon next year and also in 2025. So New Glenn will not only be flying next year, it will be delivering a Pathfinder version of the Blue Moon Lander to the lunar surface next year. I'll believe it when I see it, but still, it's a very aggressive plan, and I applaud it. And also, if successful, it does indeed test many of the technologies well before the final lander has to mature. This is something that Dynetics was simply incapable of doing. And by the way, this isn't costing NASA any money at all, because Blue Origin was planning on doing this anyway. So, a big advantage there, definitely. And as as far as the lander itself is concerned, well, Blue Origin took the old design, tossed it into the dustbin, and started all over again. Instead of putting the crew hatch ridiculously high above the ground, they put the entire crew compartment on the bottom of the lander, and then the liquid oxygen and liquid hydrogen tanks on top. This, of course, gives easy access to the ground, the ability to hard dock with a lunar rover, essentially all of the things that the Alpaca was able to do. So they got rid of a lot of the weaknesses of the old design and also introduced 
full reusability. Blue Moon will be able to carry four astronauts to the surface of the moon in a great deal of comfort, really, compared to the Alpaca. It's a lot more spacious, and in addition to that, it can carry 20 tons in reusable form or 30 tons in expendable form for delivering cargo to the lunar surface. That, of course, is an extremely impressive capability and far in excess of what NASA was really looking for, at least for its initial expeditions to the moon, and also something that will be able to take care of NASA's needs in the long term. Of course, Starship can do this too. As a matter of fact, it can do it even better given the fact that it has a much larger fairing and a much heavier payload capability. Really, if you want to talk about something that's going to be able to sustain an ever-growing presence on the moon, Starship is the better sustainable solution, whereas the initial mission should have been carried out with a smaller scout ship a ship that we don't have. Instead, what we have really is a full-scale starship and a scaled-down starship that will also require low-Earth orbit refueling in the same way that Starship is going to require it, except it's also going to require a lot of new vehicles that we have yet to see, whereas Starship is much more mature in its current development process. But to be fair, for the purposes of this contract, the Blue Moon Lander over-delivered on its capabilities. It can definitely handle the four astronauts that NASA needs it to handle, in extreme comfort actually, and deliver larger payloads than NASA is going to need for Artemis 5 and probably 6, 7, and 8 as well. Dynetics Alpaca barely could handle those requirements. Four astronauts would be a little cramped inside the Dynetics Alpaca. I'm not going to lie. It's not a very large crew compartment, and Blue Moon has a much larger cargo capacity as well. So, really, Blue Moon comes out ahead, at least when it comes to capabilities, unless you're trying to land in rough terrain at Shackleton Crater. Landing on any kind of significant grade with a really tall lander like Blue Moon could be extremely risky, whereas Alpaca, I maintain, would still be the far safer lander to use in the more inhospitable regions of the lunar south pole. And there is another consideration. The Dynetics proposal only calls for a single uncrewed mission in 2027 before launching the final product in 2028, whereas Blue Origin, because of the enormous amount of money that Jeff Bezos is investing in the entire lunar economy in the first place is going to be able to carry out a wide variety of test missions with a wide variety of pathfinders from 2024 until Artemis 5 eventually happens, whereas Dynetics would simply be incapable of doing that financially. This exposes the Dynetics lander to a greater amount of risk. If that first 2027 test mission were to turn out to be unsuccessful, or problematic, Dynetics would have to carry out another test mission at their own expense, something that's been a big problem with Boeing Starliner. However, if this lander were to fail, isn't that the point of having a second backup anyway? Why wouldn't Starship be able to step up if this first solution turns out to be not that viable? Why do we need all of these test flights first before we'd use a redundancy lander. I don't see the point in that, and it's almost overkill when we're talking about testing things to failure. Now, of course, it would be just fine if Blue Origin were likely to set down on the moon in 2028 with Blue Moon. Why not have more tests before the landing takes place? But here's the point. Given all of the things that Blue Origin needs to build, all of the things that Blue Origin needs to launch and test, there is no way in hell this lander is going to be ready to set down on the moon by 2028. I will be shocked if it's able to set down on the moon in less than 10 years.
And unsurprisingly, NASA has already noticed problems in Blue Origin's overall schedule. Quote, Blue Origin's Integrated Master Schedule, or IMS, contains numerous conflicts and omissions. The Volume 3 management proposal states that Blue Origin's schedule management approach is anchored by the program IMS, a single source of truth for the whole team. However, the IMS has numerous conflicts and omissions, which is a weakness of their proposal. I have some concern with this aspect of the proposal and view it as a potential schedule management process weakness for integrating disciplines, integrated product teams, and or subcontractors, and contrary to the stated single source of truth intent of the IMS. These flaws in the IMS increase the risk that delivery deadlines may be missed due to incorrect documentation and increases the risk of confusion across the contractor and NASA teams as multiple delivery dates are documented or missing. So given the fact that the IMS is so deeply flawed, I think it's important that NASA take any sort of estimated dates of landing this thing on the moon with a serious grain of salt. Unlike the Dynetics proposal, which I think at least would have a reasonable chance of putting an unmanned test on the surface of the moon by 2027, I really don't see how something this big, this ambitious, and requiring this much much infrastructure is going to be able to be deployed in anything less than 10 years. Perhaps by 2030 or 31, if Blue Origin were to break all kinds of speed records, but given the fact that none of these partners have been able to create a new system from the ground up in less than nine years, and by the way, the Boeing Starliner, yeah, it's only nine years in development, but it's still not operational. I think that it's rather foolhardy for anybody to assume that Blue Moon is going to be ready for operation anytime sooner than 10 years from now, which means it's not a viable alternative to Lunar Starship. It's not going to provide an alternative or competition for Lunar Starship for these initial missions. If Starship fails to do the job for Artemis 3 and Artemis 4, then Artemis is dead. Whereas Alpaca could have offered a viable solution by 2027, in my opinion. Now, to be clear, given all of the Pathfinder missions that Blue Origin has planned, I believe that this solution does have an excellent chance of succeeding in the long run, that NASA has made a very good and safe choice for the long-term future of Artemis assuming it survives that long with zero tangible results, assuming that Congress continues to fund this thing year after year, even though they fail to put any human beings on the surface of the moon. Also, there is a big inconsistency with this lander and lunar starship for that matter, and everything that was planned for Artemis up to this point. Lunar Gateway and Orion don't have near the habitable space that these lanterns have, why the sudden need for all of this massive habitable space just to set a couple of astronauts down on the surface of the moon? Once again, I do feel that it has a very good chance of succeeding in the long run, but it also has an equally great chance of being canceled given the fact that it's going to take this long to see a real tangible result and also an excellent chance of losing this race to the People's Republic of China if they are less timid about the whole thing. And there is one more thing to consider, and I'm going to quote space journalist Eric Berger. This is an incredible pivot in history. We have a private competition to build landers to put humans on the moon with fixed price contracts that pits two of the richest Americans against one another. This is not your mama's NASA. I'm not sure if Eric meant to say it this way, but you're right. This is not your mama's NASA. Your mama's NASA at least gave companies that didn't have billionaire founders a chance of winning a contract. 
These days, that possibility simply does not exist. No matter how innovative your solution, no matter how impressive the technology, if you don't have a billionaire backing up your plan with the capability of investing tons of his own money, you may as well forget it. I mean, look at who won this contract. A company that sued NASA and held up the entire HLS process for six months. A company that after more than 20 years has still not reached orbit with any vehicle or any rocket. A company that has yet to prove itself in any meaningful way, and yet they are now a crucial part of mankind's return to the moon. Would this have happened if Jeff Bezos was not CEO and founder of Blue Origin? No way. And let me tell you something, an environment like this smothers competition rather than encourages it. I need to tell you something about American football, a concept called prevent defense. When a team is ahead by a touchdown or less than a touchdown and there's less than two minutes to go in a game, oftentimes a coach will decide to play a prevent defense where they only rush three out of 11 players against the quarterback and keep the other eight back to prevent receivers from catching the ball and gaining too many yards. Yes, they give up a lot of yards, but they don't give up the good play that will give the other team a last moment victory. However, as we have seen many, many times, at least those of us who are fans of American football, the prevent defense doesn't work very often. Very often what it does is it does indeed give up quite a number of yards, maybe not the big play, but enough small plays for the team to eventually get a big play at the end of the process to get close enough to the goal line to where they have a reasonable chance of punching the goal into the end zone. It is such a frustrating thing to see a defense that has been so successful for an entire game scale back its aggressive Aggressiveness, scale back to only three rushers in the hopes that somehow the other eight are going to be able to keep the other team from scoring a touchdown forever. Obviously, this is an approach that doesn't work in many cases. It's such a frustrating thing to watch. And in my opinion, NASA is playing that prevent defense. Right now, they're doing everything they possibly can to not lose, to not sacrifice astronauts in the process, to test equipment out as thoroughly as possible in as many trial runs as they can manage both with Starship and with the Blue Moon Lander because that's the safest way to proceed without really concerning themselves about how difficult it's going to be to develop all of the new technology and the new rockets necessary and the new infrastructure to land either one of these solutions. And really, as I've said before, the Blue Origin lander is little more than a scaled down starship that still requires new rockets that have yet to fly, aren't even really close to flying yet, and also a new infrastructure Structure that will be very difficult and complicated to set up. I don't anticipate that this Blue Moon solution is going to be able to land on the moon anytime earlier than 2030, and I think it's going to be more likely to be 2033, which means everything depends on Starship now. Alpaca, because it didn't require the same kind of infrastructure, didn't rely on rockets that have yet to fly and are a long ways from flying, it could have done it quicker. And sadly, it's no longer in the race. So, for better or worse, it's time to say goodbye to Alpaca. Thank you very much for watching, and as always, stay angry about space.